Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! With me tonight, Theresa May's right-hand man in the Cabinet, a former Europe minister who campaigned to remain, David Liddington. Labour's shadow business minister who worked for 20 years in the private sector before becoming an MP, she on Wurra. Uh, the comedian broadcaster, political podcaster, Matt Ford. The political editor of the Sunday Express, Camilla Tomini. And Britain's best known personal finance guru, on television and founder of the website moneysavingexpert.com, Martin Lewis. Thank you very much. Just a reminder, if you trust yourself to go on social media, our hashtag is BBCQT. <laughs> It's at your own risk. Um, the first question tonight, let's have it from Helen De Stefano, please. Does Donald Trump deserve the Nobel Peace Prize? Yeah, well, that's a good start. Um, 18 Republicans have nominated Donald Trump for the Nobel Peace Prize. Does he deserve it? Presumably only if he makes peace with Stormy Daniels. Um, <laughs> Matt Ford. Well, <laughs> he's made something with Stormy Daniels. I'm not sure it was, <laughs> not sure it was peace. I don't think he's done anything to justify it yet. I mean, in an odd way, I wouldn't be against someone getting the Nobel Prize if they'd actually achieved something. But at the <laughs> moment, I don't think he's done anything that justifies it. People point to his apparent uh, success in the Middle East, but also that's to do with the other politicians and actors in the region. And watching the inspirational footage of North and South Korea, of Kim Jong-un and his, his Southern Korean counterpart crossing both ways over the border, that really is the total opposite of the world that Donald Trump wants to live in. Donald Trump, had he led one of those nations, would have built a wall to separate them. So I don't think he deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. I, d I mean, uh, uh, Stormy Daniels deserves something, not just money, but <laughs> some sort of... Uh, uh, I mean, time in some sort of institution, I imagine, to get over the awful stress... Careful, that careful, through. careful, Matt. Well, I feel sorry for Stormy Daniels. Yeah, no, you're she, all right, fine. But <laughs> she deserves some sort of... Stormy Daniels definitely deserves some sort of prize for... Having done Didn't what she's she get done. 130 grand? Yeah, but sometimes it's about more than money, isn't it? Wow. Well, I think <laughs> she's making her point now, though. I mean, she right? may well be complicit in him not getting a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> OK, Camilla, Camilla Domini, what do you think? Do you think he's done enough with um, North Korea, for instance, to deserve a Nobel Peace Prize? Well, I think the movement in North Korea is really fascinating to watch, and it's been borne about by some of his rhetoric, perhaps, but also some sort of rapprochement, it seemed, at the Winter Olympics as well. Um, it's a bit too premature, though, to know what Kim Jong-un is up to. Um, there's been talk about denuclearization. I don't know if we can take him at his word at this stage. Having said that, Nobel has had a history of awarding controversial peace prizes. Obviously, Kissinger is famous for... It was described as the Nobel War Prize when he won it in 73. Um, another more recent example is Aung San Suu Kyi, who uh, won it in 91 and, of course, now has turned her back on the Rohingya people and there's been mass genocide there. So perhaps we should be asking ourselves what the point of the peace prize is if it's being at all questioned when it comes to who it's been awarded okay. to. Well, I think that Donald Trump's um, impact on peace um, needs a little bit more time to play out before we can have any confidence um, in it. Um, he certainly caused a, a great deal of um, strife yeah, for those who support women's rights, uh, for those who support migrant rights, for those who believe that uh, we need to live together um, rather than be divisive. It is clear, you know, so the, the North Korea and South Korea rapprochement is a really important step forward, and I welcome that absolutely. And clearly, you know, Donald Trump played a role in that. But when we look at what's happening with Iran, you know, and the, um, the Iran nuclear deal is important to all our security, to all our safety. It is a deal which is working, um, and we need to make sure, and I think the British government particularly, needs to make sure 
that uh, Trump does not sort of um, pull out of it, as he has suggested. There is a, perhaps a possibility that by, if you like, bringing together sort of world leaders like uh, Macron and others in trying to put, convince and persuade Donald Trump uh, to be a better global citizen, um, that he may achieve uh, more peace than, than, the, um, than, the, than the support than, than he looks like at the moment. But uh, for the moment, I think it's too early to tell. OK. Um, uh, Martin Lewis. When we've seen peace prizes before, when they've been awarded to warring factions who come together in peace, that have had long-term antipathy, I think you can see the reason for awarding the prize. But what Donald Trump has done, which is sabre-rattling, upping the rhetoric, talking about my missile is bigger than you, and using threats, even if it does help towards a rapprochement between North and South Korea, if we were to reward that with the Nobel Peace Prize, we should rename it the ignoble, ignoble Peace Prize. It would be... I, I don't want to live in a world where we award a peace prize to someone who rattles the sabre for rattling the sabre. So my answer, very plainly, to whomever asked it, forgive me, is no. OK. Let's go back there. I mean, the idea of giving Donald Trump the Nobel Peace Prize would be an even bigger joke than making a Tony Blair peace envoy to the Middle East. It's a complete <laughs> and utter travesty. And far from actually this talk of rapprochement and the rest of it, we should be talking about celebrating diversity in the streets of the UK when, Tony, when Donald Trump comes to the UK. We should be protesting, not offering the hand of friendship. Let's not do what Macron did. Let's sort of make sure that we celebrate diversity and inclusion and protest against Trump. OK. David Lindsay. I think in answer to, to Helen's question, I mean, I'm probably rather glad that it's the um, Nobel Peace Prize Committee, not governments that have the job in doing this, and I think they, they make a better job of it because they're an independent body. My general view on this is that to give the award to a leading politician at an early stage in his or her career is probably premature. And if I think back to when President Obama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and President Obama is somebody who I suspect would probably get a bigger round of applause in the United Kingdom than President Trump does. Um, but, again, that was very early on in his time as president. And I, rem I remember some of the reaction globally was one of surprise, you know, however much goodwill they had towards Mr Obama, was it not too soon? So I think we, we should judge President Trump's peacemaking uh, record by what he does during his time in office. And that means Korea, yes, where American brokering may be important, what happens in the Middle East, and so on. But I often think that some of the best, the most deserved awards are those that go to relatively little known international institutions rather than to individuals that are working day in, day out. You think of a a recent topical example after the Salisbury attacks that the um, Organisation for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons has un unusually come into the headlines and the front pages of newspapers in this country. Mm. Now, the OPCW mm. has been beavering away on its work year after year after year. There are many other such uh, relatively little-known international organisations. I hope the Nobel Peace Committee will look at them as well as okay. at individuals. Thank you very much. Well... It should be said there are over 300 nominations for the prize, so I don't know what his chances are. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to another question now because um, we've, we've got a lot to get through just before we go to it. Kettering next week and Kensington in London the week after. There's the number to go. You'll be extremely welcome to come to Question Time. We're always looking for lively members of the audience. I'm going to go on to a topic which affects a lot of people here from Theresa Morrish, please. Is home ownership within the reach of younger people if they ditch takeaway coffees and avocado toast? Is, yes, that's a good quote. It's from an, Ameri um, an Australian real tycoon who said, when I was trying to buy my first home, I was buying smashed avocado and four coffees. The expect I wasn't, rather. The expectations of younger people are very, very high, implying they don't really save enough money to do it. Um, you're the money expert, Martin Lewis. <laughs> Is housing ownership within the reach of younger people if they ditch takeaway coffee and avocado toast? And obviously, it affects a large number of young people in this audience. So, 
I actually had a Guardian journalist who talked to me and wrote an article after living this way for six weeks because she posed the question to me. And when I initially looked at her, her income, um, we don't really use multiples anymore to get a mortgage. We use affordability criteria. But effectively, as a single person, you're going to be looking at buying, buying four or five times at a very, very top end what you earn. And in many parts of the country, especially in the southeast of England, that is not going to get you close to getting a studio flat. So the idea that we should say sacrifice everything, sacrifice everything in order to get a house and you'll get a house and it's your own fault, I think is frankly insulting upon the young people of this country. So uh, having, uh, having you accept home ownership is out of no, the reach of most young people or what, of a whole generation? I maybe. think what we have to do now is... What I wouldn't say to young people is that means give up. The fact is, if you start out at 24, 25, you have decent career progression, your income will go up. And the sooner you start saving, because you should build up for a 10% deposit, the government likes to encourage 5% deposits, the mortgage rates are way too high, push for 10%, don't go for 5%, that's not sensible. So you need a 10% deposit to buy a house. It's going to take you a number of years to get there, possibly 5 or 10. But the earlier you start to save, the sooner you may have a chance, we have the help to buy ISA and the lifetime ISA. I won't go through which one's best and how you should work. I could, but I won't. After. After. <laughs> so, so I think people do have a chance, and there is always the multiplier. If you do buy a coffee every day to work, and it does cost you £2, there are 250 working days in the year. Two times 250 is £500. If you decide to have the opportunity cost and say, I will forgo my coffee and put that £500 in a help to buy or lifetime ISA to save for a house, it will get you to the point where you can buy it more quickly. But start to berate everyone for the depression of not having those opportunities is a mistake and won't encourage young people to help themselves. Though we do have a problem in this country that we celebrate house price inflation. In, went to the supermarket and said, last things are 2% more expensive than last year. I wish they were 10% more. We would never celebrate that. But when it comes to house prices, for some reason, the news reports house prices going up as if it's something to celebrate. Okay. Well, not really for anyone other than those who are selling and going to rent. The only Because everybody else, if you're going to move up, it just increases the gap to your next one up. And if you haven't bought in the first place, it makes it more difficult. We have to get away from that okay. whole mentality. Um, well, I was brought up in this town, so I know what the house prices are like. And um, if you're brought up in the South East, then you look at your children and you just think, there's no way on earth my kids will be able to live anywhere ne near where me and my family were brought up and near their grandparents. Um, I think the average wage is around £22,000 a year. So at four times that, you're suggesting to people that they should be looking for houses for eighty-eight grand. Well, you guys all know that there's no way on earth you would find a house for that much, not just in St Albans, but probably in Hertfordshire area, or indeed anywhere near the M25. So that's problematic. But equally, there have been a lot of pledges from successive governments about house building that simply haven't been met. Our population has continued to grow and there is far too much demand and not enough supply, particularly around the M25 because everyone wants to commute into London. Yeah. So, uh, really, uh, governments need to be putting their money where their mouth is and building more homes. And I know there are Conservative pledges. There were Labour pledges, I believe, at the end of Labour's um, tenureship. Only 77,000 houses were built when they promised over 100,000, something like that. You know, I think you should be doubling the numbers and be suggesting that not 100,000 plus, but 250,000 plus, particularly in hard pressed areas, is the amount of building we need to right. be doing. Okay. Look, Mark there. <laughs> I'm, told, I'm told that in, in St Albans, the average house price is 16 times average local salary. The uh, say, issue yes. really isn't between about building houses. It seems they're building houses on every kind of bit of spare land they've got in St Albans. The issue is there is no affordable housing here. Yeah. There is nothing for people of my age, 23 years old. I'm a graduate. I've moved back to St Albans. There is no way I will live within a 40-minute drive of my parents because of house prices at the moment. A two-bed house on my street is about £450,000. Wow. Without working in London and City, I'm never going to be able to afford yeah. that. And you, sir, up there? Um, I was just thinking, why doesn't the government focus a bit more on um, freeing up empty houses, ones that have already been built, mm. but no-one's mm. living in them? Because I can imagine an area like St Albans, there'd probably be 
quite a number that would then add to the housing okay. stock. I'd like to hear from lots more people, particularly okay. young people, about this in, in St Albans. You, sir, there, and I'll come to you, Chin Lim. Yes. Um, we're obsessed in this country of uh, home ownership. Yeah. Um, what we need is a government to really help people who can rent, who want to yeah. have yeah. their independence. Um, I think there needs to be more focus on that and not so be so obsessed with owning a home like in the continent. Chian Wura, what, what do you make of his point? I think it's absolutely right, you know, you're absolutely right that we need to be able to have social affordable housing to rent. And in, you know, in Newcastle, for example, you know, housing is the number one issue because there just isn't um, affordable housing available to rent um, there. And, and I know, it, it, I mean, my first job actually as an engineer was around here in Hemel Hempstead. I didn't believe you know, at the time I would ever be able to afford to buy, some, to buy a place or even to live on my own by renting. But over time my salary increased and I could. That was 20 years ago. That option isn't open to so many people, so many of the young people here, because we are never going to, you're never going to reasonably have an income which can enable you to buy a place or even, you know, to rent a decent place. That is because our housing market is broken. It is absolutely broken. You know, it isn't meeting the needs of renters or buyers, or, or renters or buyers, and we need to significantly change it. And that's why you know, Labour has committed to building a million new homes over five years, over the next parliament, but making sure that at least 100,000 of them are affordable and are able, affordable to be, for buying and for renting. You know, I think we really... What were you to... committed to last time you were in office? Uh, well, so I think the point that, the point that Camilla makes, you know, is, it's, it's a really important point. When we were in office, what we did was we rebuilt we renewed 1.4 million homes which were in a dire circumstances because of the previous government. So you can argue that we should have, rent, we should have built more homes, and I think we should have as well, but we actually made 1.4 million homes in this country habitable. Now, since then, the mm -hmm. situation has got even worse, and we need to not think that it's a, a sort of laissez-faire, let, let the market decide. Having a home is a fundamental right and it makes a difference. I see in, you know, in, in my constituency, you know, I see that where you have owner occupiers, you know, where you have people who can stay renting but have a long-term lease, you know, the street looks better, the so environment you're in, you're in is better. you're in favour of ownership, not renting? No, like a long, a long, but protected long-term lease. All people right, who fine. have to move every six months, they can't invest in their home. Okay. We need to give Which, private sure. renters, we need, so, but this is really important, yeah, right. we need to give private renters the rights so that they can stay in their own homes they can stay in their homes people are moving having to move every six months and that just isn't acceptable okay. you, you. I think that too often young people are blamed for not being able to afford things that we can't ever afford yeah and maybe I'm entitled, like the headlines always tell me, but I would like to be able to buy a house in the future without having to give up every single coffee and every single small thing I buy. Yeah, and you're right. right. David, you're right. David, David yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, before I come to, uh, to, to Theresa's question about, about home ownership, I, mean, I actually agree with what a number of other people in the audience have said, that we need a mix. Do, do, do you um, agree with what she said just now? What she, yes, I do. Um, very, very much so. Um, and and uh, if, I, if I can, David, I'll, I'll, I'll come and sort of address um, Helen's point, point directly in a, in, in a second. But the, we need a mix. We need a mix of housing for ownership, housing for rent, housing of shared ownership. And, yeah, I can yeah, recite the, the statistics that the, you know, there's £9 billion going into a, uh, affordable homes programme, more affordable homes in the last seven years than in the, the previous, and yeah. so on. Sajid you know, Javid no, wanted but, 50 billion, well, didn't yeah. he? Is that right? Sajid, well, yeah. he did want 50 billion. I mean, that's... Um, we've his? got We've got um, a lot of Sorry, money going in. Yeah. No, did, I'm, not, did I'm not going to talk about internal budgetary discussions. No, wait, 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 wait. It was said that he said we can oh, sensibly... <laughs> well, I quote it, we can sensibly borrow more to invest in infrastructure that leads to more housing, take advantage of some of record low interest rates, okay. if we get 50 billion. Well, now, of course, he's Home Secretary is more powerful than the way that well, you, you are. Well, if, you, you could... if, you, if you're talking, you know, infrastructure, which you talked about, is a key way in which to release land for housing because 
Um, one of the things, to address Theresa's point, that we need to get more houses built and to make them affordable for people who want home ownership, and I think the dream of home ownership still matters a great deal to huge numbers of young people, is that we have to ensure that the, the roads, the broadband, the railway connections are there, so you actually, I think that is the way to reconcile existing communities to welcoming development and not always resisting it. I completely agreed with what Helen said because I find it incredibly difficult. And I have young people in my surgery um, constituency in the next door county who say we are in full-time work, we earn a decent wage, but we can't afford to get to even the, the bottom of the housing ladder. And it's fair to say young people yeah, should, should make an effort to save, but not, as Lady said there, give up everything else. And we have... Uh, an expanding population. We have more households because of social uh, change and people living longer for any given level of population than we had a generation ago. And for areas like St Albans, areas like mine, these large-scale housing developments are controversial, but we've got to think about the next generation and we are building to make life tolerable for them. All right. The, the person in the bang in the middle of the audience there, you... I think something that didn't affect our generation, though, was student fees, um, tuition fees. So when you are talking about investing in infrastructure, mm -hmm. one of the things that happens now for young people is that they go after their, their dreams, they want to go for further education, they have to pay for that. We didn't have those debts to pay back. Matt Ford. <laughs> I think the rate of house price increases is, is really quite shocking. I rent, uh, and I'm, I'm frankly tired of being told that I should be happy to rent by people who own their own home. <laughs> Wanting to own your own home is not an ignoble ambition. Wanting to put something aside so that you've got some security for yourself. I don't have children yet, but one day I would like to have children. I'd like to be able to give them the security that I never had. My mum never owned our own home. She still doesn't own a home now. I live in London where, even if you do save, interest rates are so low that unless you are investing that in property, you are losing money. Your own money is getting worthless by the day. And the only thing that will change that is radical political action. Now, in 1947, they set up a national health service. When the political will exists to make huge infrastructure changes, then those changes happen. And we are getting to a point now where I actually think it's bigger than tuition fees. I think if either of the two major parties enacted a huge house-building programme, that it would be far more profound for the life chances, not just of young people. I'm 35 years old and I haven't got a deposit for a house yet. It is absolutely <laughs> chronic out there. Now, so, well, I am 35. I thought people were going to question my age. Though, <laughs> I? <laughs> I might look older, but I am 35. Hopefully people think I look a bit younger. But if the political will existed, then the world would change. And the Tories, who apparently are all at sea, they have no idea how to conquer Jeremy Corbyn, if the Tories enacted a huge infrastructure programme to build more houses, they would, they would, I genuinely believe, capture the will of the people. All right. Okay, uh, David, yes, I'll, I'll come to you, actually. Uh -huh. Matt. I'm so thankful for the lady up there for mentioning tuition fees because I have watched Question Time debate tuition fees for the last five years and I've thrown more socks at the television every time it's been misexplained than I can possibly tell you. So, let's just be very plain on the impact of student finance on mortgages. When you get your student finance, it works not like a loan but like a graduate contribution system. You repay 9% of everything you earn above 25 grand. So let's be plain, borrow £20,000, earn £30,000, you repay £450 a year. Borrow £50,000, earn £30,000, you repay £450 a year. They put tuition fees up to a million quid, so you've borrowed £3 million, you earn £30,000, you repay £450 a year. And you will probably do that for 30 years like a graduate contribution system. So, it has a very minor effect on your disposable income, having a tuition fee and maintenance loan combined. It does not go on your credit file. It is effectively like mildly increasing the amount of tax that you pay, just like increasing pension contributions also decreases your disposable income. It is not a big issue for getting a mortgage. The issue, biggest issue that young people face for getting a home is primarily building a deposit to get there while they're renting, because renting is too expensive. Right. Tuition fees is a red herring. All right. <laughs> so... I think, uh, I'll come to you. Uh, the man there on... Yes, you, sir. Yeah. I think we're sending too many people to uni and not concentrating on trades. I'm 24, I've just <laughs> bought a house in Leeds. 
and I wouldn't have done that if I'd gone to uni and done a ridiculous course and come out without a job. <laughs> I think you've got to be really careful with that because for years, middle-class parents sent their kids to university, no one batted an eyelid. The moment working-class parents dare to send their kids to university, they face that salt snobbery. And I really think about it, so. Well, it's not his snobbery. He says he's... He, what, what, are you, what are you actually doing? Electrician. Needs. Electrician. Not his okay. snobbery. He's saying he chose to be no, an but electrician. He, but but not choosing him to be a snob. You, but don't, don't stop other people from no, daring to have an people, academic dream. I think, I think uni is, is pushed too much. I, when I, when I don't I, think it's pushed enough. So how, sorry, let's just it's get this... It's shoved down your throat. Let's just <laughs> get this clear. How, how long have you been an electrician for? Uh, for four years. And when do you buy your house? Last year. Last year, on a mortgage? I, I am very lucky. It's not local, because I can't afford local, but I do think we're pushing too many young people to uni, and they're coming out, and, and they're not getting a job. All right, and the, the woman up there, and Chair, will come to you next. The woman there with spectacles, in the second row from the back. Well, I think whilst the, um, the man down there makes a very valid point about university being a very popular option, now apprenticeships and things are emerging a lot more popular mm. than it was yes. before. I know when yeah. I'm in school, there are a lot of people like Acom and uh, companies like that who are invested in young people, mm. and that helps them to get out of that kind of <laughs> debt, and it, it's not just a university central route anymore. Does it make it any easier to get a house? Uh, well, I can't speak from experience, so... Right. Right. All right, Chief. If only, we <laughs> had, if only we hadn't killed the budget for careers advice in schools, we might be okay. able to direct young okay. people to okay. make the right Gee. options. Gee, now, I, OK, so... I agree with you on... I agree with you on careers advice, and I agree with both of the people who are talking about vocational education and apprenticeships, and thank you for mentioning apprenticeships. And, of course, though, Martin, if somebody, and particularly if someone from a working-class background, has £57,000 oh, of don't, debt... Don't tell them... Look, it, look it, no, politicians do me, this all the time. No, let and me you be can, clear. You're you, making it, your political points and you're doing it and you put off young people from underprivileged backgrounds from going to university with a fear of debt mm. by framing no. it as a debt when you know it doesn't work like that. And I, politicians <laughs> need to take responsibility. Your political football that you and all the parties have used student finance to be has miseducated a generation about how student finance works and it is an abomination you should all hold your heads in shame because there are people from poor backgrounds on television. I saw a programme two weeks ago saying I can't afford to go to university. Well, mm -hmm. you know what? It is expensive. It's an increased form of taxation when you leave, but it is not framed as a debt. It shouldn't be called a debt. It's a graduate contribution right. system. So don't even go there. All right. Don't All right. go there. Yeah. OK. Is, she, your right to reply, really, obviously. It is really important to recognise that tuition fees are an obstacle for students. Psychological. Going into steady on, Martin. It's psychological, steady, but steady. a lot of the world is psychological, Martin. You know, how things are perceived is what, he, what, is what supports people's choice. Well, you can argue to re-educate, or you can argue, as we have done, to abolish tuition fees. Let's go back to Let's housing. Let's abolish we... tuition right. fees. And talk yeah. about housing. Uh, well, I think it, it is... It is it is no. uh, related. I think let's yeah. abolish but tuition fees. The question fees. was about housing. Um, and then, you know, Martin and I can agree about having further education on Absolutely. debt. Absolutely. When it comes to housing, though, the, you know, what we, we talk about a, you know, in, in, in a major programme of house building, that is what Labour is proposing. When, you know, when David says we need to, I'm not sure what, what he exactly he was saying, we need to have more houses, but he hasn't, his government is not able to actually invest any money, significant money, in transforming the housing market. We have said that we will have a 250, £250 billion pound infrastructure transformation fund, which will help build houses at a rate which will transform the housing market All right. in this country. Well, no, haven't, no, no, well, haven't a load of Labour-run councils blocked yeah. the housing building? Look at Haringey. They were going to build thousands of houses. It's been blocked because Labour are saying, look, you're not um, adding enough affordable housing. But the developer's saying, in order for this to be financially viable, you, we need to include you know X amount affordable of affordable housing. housing. Yeah, I hope you know what affordable housing means but, but Can in, I just finish my point? The point is, Chi, do you want some affordable housing or none? Because a lot of Labour councils are blocking the building. Lambeth, there was a story in the paper yeah, last week, had promised in the last manifesto it was going to build 10,000 homes. It's built 17. All right. Now, I think, Labour no, okay, I, no, wait a moment. I think David, David, David Liddington is being... If you go on, David Liddington is being let off the hook because <laughs> she said 
the Tories had no policy. You must answer it, David. Yes, and I'd, I'd say, argue yes. very strongly <laughs> that no we problem. have an ambitious policy for, for housing. Um, will you let me say in passing, I thought the gentleman in, in blue was right to talk about vocational training and apprenticeships. I don't see any contradiction between the widest possible opportunities for people who wish to go to university to do so, but also to do what in this country we've not succeeded under any government in doing properly since the Second World War, and have a system of vocational education and training... And is everybody going to get a house that equal, way? Is that yeah. the Equal argument? esteem. Is everybody that going to get a house? Well, That's in terms of housing, housing. We've, we've set ourselves a target in, our, in the white paper published last year of getting the house building rate up to 300,000. There is no snap your fingers single answer to that. It will involve tackling things not just like large scale garden towns in particular locations and putting the road and rail infrastructure in to support those developments. It will mean working with local authorities on identifying the smaller, difficult brownfield sites in town and city centres that the big builders tend to ignore. And it means trying to get the big builders to stop the practice of getting planning permission for development and then just sitting on the land bank mm. and not actually getting the houses built All and right. putting them on the market. Can I give David, can I give no, you... No, I mean, very, I, I very, very quickly, expert. I mean, I, uh, just uh, one, uh, one exam, concrete example, Oxford to Cambridge um, Arc, the best prospect for economic development anywhere in Europe at the moment. The government is putting in an east-west rail link, an east-west expressway road link that will free up the opportunity for the development of hundreds of thousands of new All houses, right. new settlements and additions to existing ones. Okay. And you in the front there, yes. I don't think we need to be right, young people. Uh, the words could have been chosen better, but I think there is something to it. We can't just carry on with the narrative that young people will not be able to afford housing, so let's just give up. Let's mm. wait for the market to crash or something. And I, I, think, I think we need to try, because I personally, I started relatively early. I got in relatively young. But I remember the first time I went to my bank manager, he, he looked at my finances, looked at my savings, and he said to me, you, you've got enough saved, you've got enough earnings, but you're working too hard for it. How long can you carry on working like this? So I didn't get it the first time, but I carried on like that. And I come back two years later, and now I live here. OK, we must go on. We're halfway through the programme. Tom Sharp, I'd like to have your question, Tom, please. Are members of the House of Lords the new enemies of the state? <laughs> 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 members of the House of Lords, the new enemies, the, after the judges, as the Daily Mail called the enemies of the state. Government had ten defeats, I think, in the House of Lords this week. Um, on the withdrawal bill from the EU, are the House of Lords enemies of the state? Um, Camilla? Um, I think I'm probably the only Brexiteer on this panel. Is that right? I've no idea. <laughs> um, yep. So, Big for yep, I think that I feel it, it feels a bit like five, uh, four against one. Um, so we might have to once again question balance, but there we have it. What do you mean? Well, I just think that I'm you always can't, in the minority. Every issue on housing. How are we divided on housing? No, how on are we Brexit, divided on politics? On on yeah. Brexit. Well, you, it's often said. You need a panel of 12 to get every argument well. with an exact Manichaean <laughs> division between black and white. Mm -hmm. One against four? Yeah, well, just answer the question. All right. <laughs> um, I think uh, there has been um, a lot of rhetoric from some of the Lords that has been dishonest. Some of the interventions and the amendments have been dressed up as points of huge constitutional principle. People are questioning you know, whether powers are being abused and whether um, the parliamentary um, mechanics have been manipulated in favour of this big thing called Brexit that the majority of the public, when asked, actually voted for. Slim majority. Now, it, well, you say slim, but a lot of people didn't turn out to vote to stay in the EU, so it's still a majority map. Yeah. That's what the public voted for. You have Lords coming in and saying, oh, well, you know, we must make sure that the, that the parliamentarians are accountable to the public, while at the same time trying to reverse the referendum result. Mm. Right? The, <laughs> that chamber, that chamber, that, that unelected chamber is there to scrutinise legislation, right? It is not there to completely thwart it, 
right? The whole point is, with one of the amendments, they're putting arbitrary timelines on the government and taking away half of their negotiation strategy. They're dressing up as points of constitutional principle. Just be honest. Why the can't these lords be honest and say and be honest? What this they're amendment not, is... No, they're not calling it what they should do. They should call it the No Brexit Amendment. And instead of dressing it up as constitutional posturing, Tell the public like it is. The we irony. think we right. think we know better than you. We're unelected, but we think we will tell the public we know better than you. It's an absolute disgrace. OK, one second. David Livington. I mean, my, my direct answer to um, Mr Sharp's question is no. I mean, they're not the enemies of the people. They, they have, under our arrangements of government and parliament, a constitutional role to look at uh, bills sent to them by the House of Commons. Doesn't mean I agree with the amendments that the, the Lords pass. Do you I mean, or don't you agree with them? No, I don't. Um, I mean, you know, there'll be some amendments that Lords bring through on various bills that um, will often have government support. So but what's the these... point of these ten defeats? You're the government, you don't believe that they're going to be carried they, in the House of they Commons? Have the, they have the right, under our Constitution, to say to the House of Commons, we would like you to think again on this. The House of Commons can override what the House of Lords has decided. Can I and put the House you... Of, uh, these uh, amendments will all right. have to come back for the House of Commons, to the House of Commons for a decision. So I don't think they're acting improperly, even if I've disagreed with what they've done. But David Davis, the Brexit section, said there's a clear distinction between revising legislation and attempting to overturn the referendum result, which is what he says. Well, I, I, Lords I, I do uh, sympathise with what Camilla said, that I think the purpose behind uh, some of those amendments... And if you read the Hansard, Lord Hansard, accounts of the debate, Hansard. that intention is pretty clear, was actually to reverse the referendum result, not just to improve the government bill that is before them. And, and though I campaigned long and hard for Remain, I mean, I've always said we have to accept the democratic verdict when the turnout was higher in that referendum than at mm. any recent general election, and every one of the other EU governments mm. has accepted it as legitimate. There you are, Camilla, that's two... A, among five, not ah, one, okay. among five. Right, a reliever, the irony. Right, a reliever, that's Matt's, good. Matt's... The irony of Brexiteers, who fly the Union Jack and talk about our great history, now turning on the House of Lords, when they said they wanted British Parliament mm. to take back control, mm. the British mm. Parliament, yeah. the British Constitution is exerting itself. And all I would say, this idea that Leave voters don't want the, the legislation to be scrutinised, I think the 51.9% of people who voted Leave would want it to be done in the correct way. I don't think people want a mess punched by a government chamber. in hock mm. to it's Jacob rees And Chris Patton, mm. who is on the biggest beast of the Tory party, a Tory loyalist his whole life, came out and said that this legislation on Brexit was clueless and delinquent. Now, I don't know whether he was talking about Boris and Michael Gove specifically or whether he was talking about uh, the legislation And yet itself. Chris Patton championed Hong Kong's independence. How astonishing he can't apply the same principle to Britain. All right, you send the front. Well, there you go, he's a pragmatist. OK, <laughs> you I, mean, I, I find those comments quite offensive, Which actually. Which ones? The, about the people voting Brexit because they like the Union Jack on our history. I voted Brexit... For the future, not for the past. I believe we'll be a stronger economy but with we a much the more. Facts tell you that we won't be. Let, well, let, let him speak. Yeah, right. I didn't vote for the past. I voted for the future, and you were saying that Brexiteers voted for the past and I the never used that joke. phrase. I never used the phrase the past. What, did, what do you, you make of the House of Lords and their ten? I think it's just ridiculous. Them. I think the politicians are able to stuff the House of Lords with the people in the numbers that suit suit the politicians, and it, we All need right, a democratic yeah. change. Yes, the, the woman here in the front row. With the gentleman over there, um, I think that even though the House of Lords they're unelected, I think that Parliament, Parliament in my definition is House of Lords and House of Commons, they should both equally have a say over Brexit and what the future should hold for the UK as a whole, because they're specialists and they know what they're talking about. They're not just some amateur people sitting on a table telling, saying things. They know what they're talking about, right. so they should have a say. And you up there on the gangway. Um, I believe they're enemies to democracy at the end what? of the day. Um, they're unelected. I believe they should have no place in the UK Parliament. And the people have voted to leave, and they shouldn't be able to uh, make abolish, amendments abolish to it at all. House Lords and yeah, definitely. I'd abolish it. Definitely. Abolish it. Right. No place in politics. Okay. No, no place. Matt and, Matt and Lewis. 
I'm always torn on the House of Lords. In political principle, I don't believe we should have an unelected chamber, but in practical terms, we get some of the best scrutiny of legislation there we do with much more expertise than we ever get in the House of Commons. And that's a difficulty. But that's, that's, just, that's just not yeah, true. Yeah, because they get 300 quid a day. Well, enough of them... Enough of them to pay. On, 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 well, the you, on the Brexit point... In and clocking out, not on really. the Brexit point, I, I, should, I should explain where I am. I was um, without my permission on millions of Remain leaflets. Without my permission. I was not mm. a Remain campaigner. Mm. I said publicly, because I was asked and, and had to say, that I was 60-40 in favour of Remain. And I'm still roughly there. Having said that, if you ask me to weigh up the importance of following our democratic process versus the importance of staying in Europe. Our democracy wins. We must now leave. Well okay. said. However, however, David, sorry, yeah. this is important. Yeah. The, the I'm travesty just here. I'm up the number of people who are saying, because of the vote, we must now leave. So it's now three to two yeah. on this We're This is... These no, are no, people, wait a minute. No, 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 there's a difference between a Brexiteer and someone who however, accepts the yeah, referendum Yeah, but you complain result. because there's people a... on the panel, are, you, you think, are going to be David. all in favour of... I voted for Remain, I'm one, know, and what four you did. voted yes. for Remain. Uh, yeah. I voted for Brexit, But he's now saying he's in favour of it, that's the, the point. Here. I just don't this like this the argument that people can't it. support the majority vote when they do clearly support the majority vote, as he does. Go on. The abomination behind all this is that David Cameron gave us a black and white vote on a rainbow of issues. And that has left us in a nightmare scenario. I... <laughs> I'm a man of numbers, 52 to 48. One would assume most Remainers, for example, were in favour of a customs union. And it is not unfair to assume that some Leavers are in favour of a customs union. So on that particular vote, it may well have been a majority for a customs union. And what I don't like is when politicians try on both sides to impute what the electorate f thought from this black and white vote, which is why I'm afraid we do need parliamentary scrutiny. The House of Lords nor the Commons should stop us leaving. We must leave. But we need to have expertise working out what is the best situation to give us that good future that you as a Brexiteer voted for. Right. So let's not degrade people. We have this problem with, with a sort of independent bias. We ask people for an independent view and they come up with a view we don't like based on an independent view and then we say you're biased. Now you know sometimes maybe you should listen to the experts. Chi. I think Martin and I mainly uh, agree, agree on this one. Oh, and, <laughs> which is nice. Do you agree and on the question, which I have to re read from Tom Sharp? Are members of the House of Lords the new enemies of the state? Is no. the question. Uh, no, no. I mean, I'm in favour of House of Lords reform, um, absolutely. But you know, I've been in Parliament eight years now. You know, you know, the Lords is not a hotbed of some kind of radical um, extremist um, enemies <laughs> of the people. They're doing their job. They're scrutinising the legislation, and this legislation needs scrutinising. It's the biggest decision that we're taking as a country since, you know, since the end of the war. And so I believe that it's abs I believe that we need to. We are leaving the European Union. That is the decision of the British people. I accept that. But the, the legislation needs to be scrutinised, and Parliament has to have a say in how we leave it, because that's how we represent the interests of, of, of the people here. And, you know, and I think you know, David is trying to, and part of this targeting the Lords, is trying to turn attention away from the absolute lack of a strategy, the incompetence, the, the total chaos, which is the... Tory party's approach to Brexit. You know, what, is, what is a customs union versus a customs partnership? And is Theresa May going to make a decision on it? You know, we've got 11 months to go. Yeah. Uh, we've got 11 months to go. It's the biggest trading partner. You know, we believe this needs to be a Brexit, which is about our future economy. It needs to be a Brexit about jobs. And I'm not talking about the jobs in the Cabinet. You know, it needs to be a Brexit that, that keeps Northern Ireland peace process, and it needs to be a Brexit that makes sure that European Union citizens have rights here and that we have rights abroad. Okay. That is the Brexit that we need. You said the second row from the back. Yes. Um, 
How many people voted Brexit and other elections because they were told to by Facebook? And is that not more un undemocratic <laughs> and more of a threat than the that's North? A, that's yeah. a very They're good really point. Yeah. So, yeah. Like Cambridge, Cambridge yeah. Analytica yeah. swung it, you think? Yes. Just a, a no. Labour's position on Brexit. I have to say, someone who used to work for the Labour Party and, and was a member until just a few years ago. Come back. And Chi, Come I know back. we have a lot in common politically, <laughs> but hearing oh. a leading Labour politician talking about a Brexit for jobs is heartbreaking. The Labour Party should be doing everything to try and stop this, not sign up to slogans that promote us leaving the European Union. Can I repeat? It's heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, the uh, fundamental brief. point I agreed with on Martin was that our democratic process w is the most is the most important thing that as a country, a democratic country. Do you want a second voted, vote still? Uh, and we want to Do you want a second vote? Um, I don't think we need a second you did vote. Ask and for I don't, it, didn't you? I, 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 I don't believe in the second vote. You for did. Why the, did you ask for no, it? No, I don't. I don't ask for yes, a second you did. vote. No. Yes, you did. Oh, you I, did. I, I, I'm so ahead. <laughs> <laughs> looking. All right. I'll read it to you if I have to read it to you. Uh, looking at the shambles that we have, it seems increasingly unlikely, and the British people deserve a vote. There's a strong argument for having another vote. Oh, 24th uh, of August, 2016. I said there was a strong. Uh, I said there was a strong argument for having a vote. Oh, I but you didn't mean they had, I, to have I one. I didn't. I said there was a strong argument. And I didn't believe there was a, there was a vote. There was a arg that we needed to have another referendum. I didn't believe it, and I don't. I don't believe it now. Strong no. argument for having another vote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lost. I'm lost. Uh, well, I, uh, politics, that, politics, that, politics. That, yeah, that, that, I think. Okay. A, I think there's an, there was there was an argument at the time, if you like. But now that we are going forward with Brexit. And we need to make sure that it is, you know, to, talk, to say that a jobs Brexit is, a, um, is impossible, then you're condemning, you know, our country effectively. Condemning the economic impact that the government themselves have right. said that a cut to GDP of between 3, 5 and 8 percent is, whichever way you sell it, soft or hard, that is a recession. There is no jobs first Brexit. It's a total fantasy. Right. Well, let's not go into that. We were talking about the House hmm. of Lords, but we are going to move on to the other big political story of the week since question time was last on and Sarah Cottingham has it. Let's have this. Did Amber Rudd fall on Theresa May's sword when she resigned over the Windrush scandal? Yes. Did Amber Rudd fall on Theresa May's sword rather than her own, David Liddington? No, she, I mean, Amber, who's a, who's a good friend, I mean, took responsibility for... What Theresa May that, has the done. statements <laughs> <that she> <laughs> 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 No, David. They, she took responsibility for the fact that she'd made statements that had given a misleading impression to the House of Commons. What she had already started to do, and Saj Javid is continuing since being appointed as Home Secretary, is to take action to make sure that those people from the Windrush generation uh, are helped to regularise the status in this country to which they are entitled. Prime Minister, Home Secretary, have given an unreserved apology to people who should never have been put through this experience at all. And there needs to be, and there is now in hand, a review of practices in handling cases within the Home Office with an independent scrutiny and oversight of that review to make sure it's not just being done in-house, mm. mm. to try to stop this happening again. But, but it's Theresa May this question is about. I mean, mm. Theresa May was the one who said the aim is to create a really hostile environment for illegal immigration. Sajid Javid comes in and says he's not going to use that expression. It's the wrong expression to use. That's a serious issue. Well, actually, I mean, the term hostile environment was being used by Labour immigration ministers during Gordon it Brown's come, come term on. in office. I think, I think, no, I think what... Was it what a wrong expression? Theresa, whether used what, by Theresa May what or Theresa, by Labour, what, was it what a wrong Theresa, expression? What Theresa has, has done, in, in, and uh, both Amber and Sajid have been doing, is using the term compliant environment, because I think there's a distinct... <laughs> just there's, no, 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 no. I, I, can, I, can send you, David, I can send you after the programme the links to the various speeches that, where that phrase was used. But the key point is this, that I think the system of immigration needs to be based on fairness and equity. Mm, and I've, in the one. years I've been in Parliament, half my mm. time's been under Labour governments, well, rather than Conservative or Coalition governments, every year I have dealt with cases where the handling of immigration has gone wrong. 
and those people who are treated wrongly need to get redress and right. steps need to be uh, taken. Would, would you like to see who are here illegally yes. should expect okay. action oh, to be taken against them? Yeah. Would, yeah. Both those would you like to arrive? see? Well, sorry, just one one point. Would you like to see the hundred thousand cap on immigration scrapped? Because hostile environment is to be scrapped. Would you like to see the hundred thousand scrapped? Well, it's not a, a a cap. There is a a, a policy ambition to reduce overall to net migration. The, the point about the cap is that the cap that I thought you were referring to was referring to people who come in under a skilled work permit. No, I'm talking scheme. about net migration as 100,000. David Cameron's I think, aim. Is it your aim? I think that we need to get the net levels of immigration down. We need to promote integration of people yeah. who come in. Do you here like lawfully. the figure? Do you and approve we, of the figure? I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. Do you approve of the figure of 100,000? I think that getting, getting it down to that sort of level should be a, is, a, is a fair objective mm -hmm. right. to do, but, but we need to do it gradually and in a way that makes sure that okay. our economy continues to be able to recruit people. Matt, Matt, Matt Ford. Matt Ford. This, I find this one of the most depressing debates I've ever had to experience as a British citizen, coming so soon after the, the vote to leave. And I, I do appreciate, actually, that leave, people voted leave for a number of reasons, and it wasn't all just about the flag and, and the past and things like that. But the disrespect we are showing to people who come to this country, not just for a better life for themselves, but for, to benefit the rest of us, is despicable. What are we saying about ourselves as a nation? Mm. We're retreating from the global stage. We're pandering to racism and xenophobia at home. We are sending home people that are as British as I am and as British as anyone else in this audience. The message that Britain is sending to the rest of the world is we are closed, we're inward looking, and not only that, we're bitter and we're rude towards people that we should be showing love and care. Hang on a minute. Right, man Hang up on there. a minute. Man up, man up, man up. Hold on. The man there. I'll come to, I will come to you in a minute. Yes. I think the um, Windrush issue speaks to incredibly low levels of competency in the Home mm. Office, where we have relatively elderly people with thick Cockney accents saying they have never owned a passport and they're being told to go home. Do you it's, think this is Theresa uh, May's fault? No, the, no, it's the not individual politicians. This right. is a waste of okay. time trying to find individual politicians. Okay. Who are they employing at the Home Office that can't look at these people and say, that man and that woman is British? OK. The, the Home that Office is not fit for service. Okay. So, before I answer the main question, I just want to pick up something David said when we were talking about this cap. Now, look, whether the cap should stay or not, the most important thing we need to look at is we immediately need to take student numbers out of the cap. It is absolutely crackers that, as a nation, we vol voluntarily limit one of our biggest export earnings at this time, which is foreign students coming to lit work at our yeah. fantastic academic You're getting away from Sarah's <laughs> question, <laughs> I, I am. I will which was the that, political blame. That was the question. It's such an important know, point and so the... damaging to our universities. Right. Now, as for, as for the Amber Rudd question, I, I do always try... I'm a journalist. I try and answer questions, not avoid them. So let me answer it. <laughs> um, not always right, true, right, no, no, no. So... <laughs> My answer on, on the Amber Rudd question, I'm an outsider to the Westminster bubble, so I don't know exactly what happened. But it certainly seems to me that Amber Rudd has fallen on, on her sword for two different groups. First of all, the civil service, who's seen when you have a civil service executive sitting next to you at a meeting and you look to them for an answer and they give you the wrong answer by the sound of it, that does not seem something that should have happened. Plus, of course, for this abominable, hostile environment to call even just the name hostile environment is just wrong in a modern democracy. And that was set up by the Prime Minister. Now, I actually have some honour towards Amber Rudd, because I do believe ministers are responsible for their department, even if they didn't make the error themselves, and we needed to see somebody fall for this. And she took it, and that was an honourable thing to do, and I congratulate her on her resignation. But, yes, if I were her, I would be giving sort of Paddington stare evils to the Prime Minister. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, but it strikes me that Amber Rudd lost her job for two primary reasons. The first one being the fact that the Windrush scandal was executed because of policies introduced by Theresa May. The second thing was this lack of knowledge of targets yeah. mm. that were introduced under Theresa May mm. with Theresa May's full knowledge as she accepted this week. So, yes, Amber Rudd quite clearly has fallen on Theresa May's sword here. All right. Thank Camilla you. first, and then I'll come to you, Chief. Um... I just want to take issue with what you've said because I don't know why you're conflating Windrush 
with Brexit and Brexiteers. Sorry. Um, why, why are you doing that? It's about the, it's, it's nothing about, to do... It, no Brexiteer in their right mind looks at Windrush and says, oh, brilliant. Camilla, it was I, an aberration. Say, Camilla, I didn't Camilla, say that. You're, you're linking the two right, unnecessarily. Camilla, right we don't have another it. half hour. The question was about well, Theresa May. Can oh, you sorry. answer that question? It's insulting no, to, no, to conflate okay, the right. two, right? Can you answer the question, though, that Sarah uh, asked? Well, in my opinion, when departments make mistakes, they should be the ones to clear it up. Amber Rudd did resign on the basis of the fact that she didn't disclose information she was meant to know. Whether she's then carried the can for Theresa May, my understanding is with Win Windrush, let's make mis no mistake, it was an absolute and total cock-up that is hugely regrettable, not only by the public but by the government. But there were three successive governments involved in it. Equally yeah. hostile environment. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Really not. And also, right. and another not. point exactly, when it comes to illegal, illegal immigration, okay. what this. sort of environment do people want for illegal immigrants All right. who are breaking okay. the law this. and not contributing I... to the tax okay. system? She... Do they want a warm and welcoming environment yeah. to illegal immigrants? <laughs> All right, she, she and Willow. Amber Rudd didn't know what was happening in her own department and yes, she needed to take the heat for that and I believe in ministerial responsibility. But Windrush, which is the persecution, Camilla, of British citizens. These are British citizens. I understand what it who, is, were, yeah, so, so why are you... I'm what, sympathetic so with these people. You've called it a cock-up. This was not the work of a moment. I called this it, was I called it the an work aberration. Of you, you, this and was I, the I work agree with of you years right. of processes Put in yeah, place. It was there was the Can you not interrupt each other Thank all you. the time? Just well, finish the, the point. Okay. The, the, we're coming that. to the end of the programme. The word was it Amber, Amber no. Rudd or Theresa May who was to blame? That was Sarah's question. I repeat it. Okay. So it took time to persecute these people in this way. It took time to make GPs and landlords the border forces while cutting the actual border force that we have. And it took time to deny, you know, people. British citizens, to dividing British citizens who get life-saving treat treatment for cancer in British citizens that don't. And the minister who was responsible for that was Theresa May. You know, we all agree this is wrong. We all agree it was wrong. Good. And yet it happened. And the reason it happened was because Theresa May put it in place. And you know, David, I believe that I'm sick and tired of ministers sim who simply blame other people when something goes wrong. You know, those aren't my words, you want to quote them, those are Theresa May's words mm. on this programme, on Question Time, speaking to you, and I want to hold Theresa May to the standard so you think she, she set herself. You think she should have... You think, um, she, you think she should have resigned? Just um, I, think, I, I think she's. I, I, think she's for I, May's I think she's. I think she is want, responsible, and she should right. take the responsibility right. for it. And she should also give us the documents that show that she's responsible. Okay, we've come to the end. You can have a brief riposte to that if you want, David, before we close the program. <laughs> well, I said I've, I've been in Parliament mm -hmm. for 26 years now, and, and every year I deal with a lot of immigration cases in my patch. Uh, during Labour governments, I have had just as many cases which have been badly handled as under oh, Conservative yeah. or Coalition governments. Yeah. And I right. think the gentleman there made the important point, this yeah. review, amongst other things, needs to sort out how we handle casework a lot better in the future. Time's up, I'm afraid. <laughs> Our hour is up.